This video is made possible by Printique, a go-to photo lab for all of your printing needs. Save 10% site-wide by using the link in the show notes below and entering the discount code HUE10 at checkout. Thanks, Printique. A few months ago, I did a video entitled Why You Should Print Your Work. Last month, I was invited by my friend Ibarian X. Pirello to participate in an online panel discussion with fellow photographer Ellen Friedlander entitled From Streets to Print. I'll put links to those videos in the description below. In both instances, more than anything else, I talked about printing as a tool to curate one's images. After all, it's much easier and cheaper to post an image on Instagram than it is to commit to a much more involved and expensive print, inevitably larger and more amenable to scrutiny. Especially if you hang it on a wall and have to look at it every day. Which is not to slam Instagram, even if I did call it the Tinder of photography in that panel discussion. In fact, I have done a video on the value of Instagram as a tool for photographers. I will include a link to that video as well. I encourage you to watch all three videos, actually, maybe even before watching this one, so that you have a proper context for why you might want to consider making large prints. Let's get into it. Hey, everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and I will cut straight to the chase. Are big prints for you? If you are serious about your photography, if you want to move beyond the four square inches of Instagram on your smartphone, the Tinder of photography, if you will, if you understand the value of printing an image large enough, say at least eight by 10, eight and a half by 11, and thus permanent enough to see things you hadn't seen before because it's so easy to come back to again and again, to realize things you hadn't realized before about your own work and by extension yourself. In other words, if you want to grow or just make life a little more interesting, a little more enjoyable every day, should you choose to actually put that image up on a wall? Well, large prints are where things get really interesting and to my way of thinking, most rewarding. Maybe the first question is how big is big? Now, I began my photographic journey during the film era more than half a century ago, having my own darkroom by the age of 12. Oh yeah. An actual eight by 10 inch print, one that I made all by myself and could tune in a way the camera store or drugstore labs couldn't, closing in on four times the size of those store lab prints. The bomb. And 11 by 14, whoa, beyond professional. I mean, way bigger than any photo in a bar mitzvah album or on the cover of National Geographic. By the time I started printing, 11 by 14 was esoteric, already bigger even than the cover of the then slightly shrunken Life magazine. So 8 by 10, yeah, that was big enough to be amazing. But in the digital era, with computers like, say, a 48 GPU Mac Studio Ultra loaded with Lightroom, Capture One, Luminar Neo, whatever software tool you happen to use. Camera sensor resolutions of 40 plus megapixels becoming de rigueur. Resolutions all the way up to 102 megapixels or more, either through pixel shifting or the raw resolution of, say, a GFX 100S with lens performance to match becoming more accessible. Inkjet printers like an $800 Epson SureColor P700 capable of printing Super A3 that is up to 13 by 19 inches. No chemicals, no enlarger, no darkroom for Christ's sake, nothing really of consequence between intent and execution. It is a cakewalk to make prints larger than most 20th century professionals would have ever imagined for their own work. Then again, while the latest smartphones can capture images printable up to Super A3, never mind, I don't know, 30 or 40 feet, like the shot on iPhone billboards overlooking the entrance to the Lincoln Tunnel. 
How many of us actually bother to print even 8 by 10? Who prints at all anymore? And write what is a large print in this context anyway? Well, how about this? At the low end, let's posit maybe 30 inches on the long side for hanging in one's home, like this. At the high end, I'm talking up to eight feet on the long side, like the photograph behind me, shot by Claudia, used as my background here in the Batcave for the past few years. And in the middle, call it gallery size, the size I'm most interested in these days, anywhere between 40 and 60 inches on the long side. That is a full five feet like this. <laughs> one defines big, I want to make the point right here at the beginning that the size at which one prints is not simply or even primarily a function of sensor resolution or format. It is first and foremost a question of intent, subject matter, and the particulars of the actual image. This eight-foot photo shot by Claudia on a 24-megapixel full-frame Sony a7 III with Sony's little $450 FE 28mm f2. Wide open at that. The a7 III doesn't have nearly the resolution of a GFX 100S, and the 28 f2 does not have the performance of the, okay, five times the price, almost, Fujinon GF32 to 64mm f4. But clearly it doesn't matter. No one will ever see those differences, at least not in this case, for two reasons. First, I'm using it as a background. Recording video at f2.8 here in the Batcave, it is never in focus other than whenever I'm not in my chair, which is basically never. And even if it were in focus, it is too far from the sensor plane. The scale of the image within the frame is too small for anyone to want to pixel peep. And second, at the settings I use to record, 8-bit 420 4K, like right now, there is not nearly enough resolution to show all of the detail that's present in the actual file anyway. In other words, that's a Mongo print, a banner, actually, perfectly fit for purpose. I have it here because it evinces the visual cacophony of New York's Soho, very much reflective of who Claudia and I are because it's where we often like to shoot. What about 27 by 40 inch, no tax breaks for billionaires image? Shot on a 24 megapixel APS-C Fujifilm X-T2. The tonality across the entire frame is wonderful. The entire image is utterly noiseless. While what I want to be tack sharp is tack sharp, the very simple sign, that is to say, an object in its simplicity that has no need of, say, 60 line pairs per millimeter at 50% contrast all the way out to the corner, the background is precisely as out of focus as I wish it to be, an institutional counterpoint to the man in the street protester where 30 line pairs at 40% contrast, for example, at the center would still be fine. We have an even bigger 29 by 44 inch print hanging in our studio, by the way, shot by Claudia on a 20 megapixel micro four thirds Panasonic Lumix G9. This photograph of four French Boy Scouts taken in Green Park, London, the impact coming from how she has captured their innocent curiosity and energy, entirely oblivious to her or anyone or anything else. Who cares if you can't make out the wording on their sweater patches? This is utterly beside the point. Right next to it in the studio, by the way, we have another print, 35 inches on the long side and an improperly cropped version of this image. My bad, it should be 55 inches. Shot by Claudia with the same camera and lens, the G9 with the Leica DG Vario Elmrit 50-200mm to 200 millimeter f2.8-4, to 4, and I think it looks fantastic. You know why I think so? Because of the subject matter, the composition, and the humor and the humanity of the shot not the resolution. Who the heck would scour this image at any size to try finding a flea on the ass of a poodle? More examples, each 30 inches on the long side. This one, Aster Place, was taken with my 47 megapixel Leica SL2 with a Sigma 24 millimeter f3.5. 
This one, 11th Avenue, was shot with my 60 megapixel Leica M11 and either Voigtlander's Apo Lanthar 35 or 50, I can't remember which, and neither is 6-bit coded. Either one of these images can easily be printed much bigger, but we simply don't have the wall space. Especially because we also have hanging in our bedroom another 30-inch print on the long side, shot with a GFX 100S and that 32 to 64. Now, that sucker could be projected on an IMAX screen and still have resolution left over, all the way up to wondering what time it is and getting an answer from that clock tower on the other side of the East River. But of all our recent forays into large prints, this one is my current favorite. Five feet on the long side, shot with a borrowed 45 megapixel Canon R5 using their 24 to 105 millimeter F4L. The detail is phenomenal across the frame, exactly as I wanted, because I am inviting people to peer deeply into the frame even as the gestalt of the image stands on its own. Let's pause here to recap the point I've been trying to make with this little tour. The most obvious answer to the question, what is the objective of a big print, is to fill a big space. But this is not what motivates me, nor, I assert, should it be what motivates you. Now, those of you who know us know that Claudia and I are street photographers, street portraitists, urban landscape artists, and witnesses. I am in love with and in awe of the constantly changing interplay of textures, shapes, light and shadow, geometry, juxtapositions, irony, and okay, occasionally the colors of the city's built environment. I am in love with and reassured by the people of New York, who almost every time we engage with them and request permission to photograph them, which we do 90% of the time, say yes. And I'm gutted by the people I sometimes see on the street who, I can no longer look away, don't have the luxury of worrying about all their needs are far more immediate. Food, shelter, clothing, safety. As an artist, I am most interested in having my work communicate. Maybe a better word is elicit. In any viewer of my work, no matter where they see it, a sense of or resonance with my emotions and the values I have not only as an artist, but most especially as a human being. The thing of it is, across a personal history of more than half a century, I, this is just blowing my mind. I'm, I'm dealing with this more and more often. And with access to the extraordinary power of the latest imaging technologies, I've come to believe that one very powerful way for me to achieve this goal, a path I did not have in the film era, is through prints sufficiently large, the same relative scale, actually, at which I photograph the scene. If any of this makes sense to you, if seeing and hearing me talk about this inspires you to explore making large prints of your own images, wonderful. Now, let's get into some of the more practical aspects of making it happen. The first thing you'll need to do is select the right image. An image you believe is worthy of close scrutiny. An image which you feel would convey a sense of something special to you at scale. But then you have to ask yourself, who is this for? What are their circumstances? Is it a gift to yourself or to someone else? Where will you or that person hang it? How will it be hung? Will either of you truly want to see it every day? Do you harbor an ambition to show or sell it? Earlier, I suggested that the small end of large prints is around 30 inches on the long side. But at a more practical level, I think it makes sense when you first start your large print journey to take a less dogmatic perspective. I'd suggest starting with a print size larger than what you've already got hanging on your wall, but not so large as to be unmanageable from a wall real estate or price perspective. If you haven't ever printed an image at the maximum size of which your current printer is capable, maybe start there. If you have reached that limit, maybe you start with something up to twice the size. But at that point, I suggest you don't immediately buy a much bigger printer, but instead begin with an outside lab, like today's sponsor, Printique. 
let me offer you my own tools, workflow, and headspace as an example. We own an Epson SureColor P900, good for images up to 17 inches wide. I bought it specifically for print sales with the intention of variableizing my cost structure beyond that size by going with an outside company. For limited edition print sales through our website, for example, gallery exhibitions or commissioned work. Beyond cost considerations and beyond 17 by 22, proper packing for shipping just becomes a chore. At 17 by 22, packing is still a chore if one has to consider framing, which is why I choose to sell the images I print myself unmounted and unframed making shipping as easy as finding the appropriately sized tube mailer. But when we do go to an outside lab, you or I are faced with additional decisions beyond size. What aspect ratio? What type of substrate? Do we want our images matted and framed or loose? Of course, the question of finish is present in either case. These were precisely the kinds of questions I had when I reached out to our friends at Printique, and they couldn't have been nicer or more helpful. But Many of the answers to these questions are less likely to come from your outside printer than from recognizing every one of them is in turn a function of who your audience is, as I've already mentioned, where and how your images will be displayed, as I've already mentioned, budget, of course, and most importantly, by far, what does the image tell you it needs? Take 11th Avenue. I like my blacks rich. For urban landscape in particular, I also like my details sharp corner to corner. I can never get enough texture. I want to invite the viewer into the city's extraordinarily rich and complex textures, shapes. You know, I've already covered this. Beyond the camera and lens, this is where the particular printing process matters. And for me, as long as it's available, there's actually nothing quite like a silver halide print to accomplish these objectives which can be done even with a digital file. That's what Printique did for this one, and I think they did a heck of a job. So did a friend of mine, actually, uh, a co-owner of one of the most renowned galleries in New York City. And while conventional wisdom suggests that a glossy finish can yield the deepest and richest blacks and retain the greatest detail, and fair enough, it does. I don't like a glossy finish. The odds of reflections ruining the viewing experience are generally too high. So in this instance, like so many others, I specified a luster finish. As for substrate, I wasn't sure if I'd frame it, so I went with paper. Here at home, I've also had some of my larger prints, like No Tax Breaks for Billionaires, mounted on board. It's relatively inexpensive, it's lightweight, it's easier to hang than an unmounted print, and if I ever do decide to have it framed, it's still possible. What about aspect ratios? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a rat's ass about aspect ratios, at least standard ratios. I crop an image the way it tells me it needs to be cropped. Whatever the aspect ratio ends up being, it is a function of this approach, not the other way around which again makes matting and framing a bit of a pain in the butt. What about this bad boy? What does it tell me? What do I see? In the Chrysler building, I see vaunting ambition. I see the era in which New York City became New York City, to my way of thinking, epicenter of the modern world. But I also see the efforts of hundreds, maybe thousands of workers, each of whom has a story I can never know multiple stories. For my intended audiences and locations, an image five feet high feels about right, about how I experienced the scale of it from where I stood when I took the shot. But in that building, I see so much more, a critical moment in the evolution of our country with some stories I know a little bit about, like the fact that legendary photographer Margaret Bourke White actually rented an apartment there for about what in today's dollars would be 10,000 a month that the chairman of Texaco at the time, Torquild Reber, had an office there and who, during the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, reneged on his contractual commitments to the democratically elected Republican government of Spain and instead almost single-handedly fueled the nationalists under Franco and both the Nazis under Hitler and the Fascisti under Mussolini, who aided and abetted him in that conflict. 
At a more mundane level, I am fascinated by that incredible iconic metal sheathing, never mind the surrounding buildings of Tudor City, another fascinating piece of New York worthy of equal scrutiny. I want my viewers to see every bit of the frame, to feel even a fraction of the awe and wonder I feel. Given all of this, I chose to have the image printed using a matte finished infused into an aluminum substrate. And with a lightweight frame on the back of the print, smaller than the print itself, in the interim before a different permanent framing solution may be required, it will appear to float off a wall in, say, a gallery, which is, once again, precisely how I want it. But that's just me. Take this image of the Washington Square Park poet. I still like my blacks rich and crisp, but I simply can't replicate that look with an archival fine art matte finish gicle print. But this time, that was what I felt the image called for. I felt the subject demanded a different balance altogether. I didn't want piercing sharpness or precise tonality to be what hit the viewer. I didn't want a metallic substrate or silver halide print to reinforce the mechanical age qualities of that building. I wanted this poet's humanity to do the heavy lifting, and I needed a process and substrate to reinforce those ideas. The image had to be smaller, too, to achieve a closer proximity and human scale to the reality as I saw him, the tonality more muted to reflect this particular soul, so profoundly different from the sheer ambition and beauty in the metal which illuminates so much of the Chrysler Building's character. In this instance, an exhibition-grade, archival-quality gicle print on a Hannah Muley matte paper gave me exactly what I wanted. On close inspection, you see just how different these finishes and their impact on the final images are. But taken separately, each image stands on its own, again, exactly how I want it. On rare occasions, actually, this is now the very first time I can say this, I want my images far larger than real life. I want a wall or walls in a gallery with these five prints, each 10 feet high. Let's turn to costs. I will once again use myself as an example. My Epson P900 can print up to 17 inches wide, I think I said that before, and costs about 1400 bucks. One set of inks costs under $500. Add a 25 sheet pack of 17 by 22 Hanamule photo rag burrito paper for 200 bucks that I like, and that total is 2100 bucks before tax and shipping. Amortize the whole thing over just those 25 sheets, and you're talking 84 bucks a print, give or take. Amortize it over as few as 100 sheets, 75 sheets more, and suddenly you're already down to 27 per. Printique doesn't do this particular ANSI standard size, so let's pick a similarly sized Gicle 16 by 20 print on Hannah Muley Fine Art Paper, close enough for this purpose, and absolutely exhibition grade. It's $39 per print, also before taxes and shipping. So your break-even point is somewhere between 25 and 100 prints. You'd print far smaller test prints, but that's a whole other subject for another video because there can be and usually are differences between how you print and how an external lab prints. You could lower the costs by starting with a far more modestly priced Epson Expression Photo XB8700 wireless all-in-one for 300 bucks that can print up to eight and a half by 11, or that $800 P700, which can print up to 13 by 19, as I think I mentioned earlier. 
either of which is certainly bigger than your smartphone screen. Though neither of these would I consider to offer large prints given what we do. But if you're well past that stage and want to go what I've called mid-size large at home, Epson's SureColor P9000, which will print up to 44 inches wide, costs a bit over 4,000 bucks before expendables, taxes, and shipping, but it is a darn good printer. On the other hand, a single 40 by 60 inch Giclée printed Printique, it's under 200 bucks. A 60 inch metal print like my favorite shot these days is another story, 650 bucks, but you can't do that on your own. Well, I know I can't do it on my own. I can't do silver halide printing from digital files either, both of which are additional reasons why I like Printique. And while Printique is absolutely sponsoring this video, I have to say, sponsored or not, working with Printique has been great. I am delighted by the results, and I reached out to them. I especially like their silver halide and metal printing. In fact, if you hop over to their website using the link in the description below and the discount code HUE10 at checkout, as I said at the very beginning, you'll save 10% site-wide and see just how easy it is to get started. That's it for now. A whole lot of whys, a couple of hows for large prints. Possibly more than you wanted to know about the whys, possibly less than you wanted to know about the hows, but hey, that's generally how I roll. In most things, for me, it's all about the why. The how is almost always easier, especially in mid-2022 when it comes to printing large. Thanks for sticking with me to the end, and I look forward to learning about your large print adventures in the comments section. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below, picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com, sending coffee money via PayPal, or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.